Um, we did three already. This will be our fourth. Uh, these are all related rates, so we're setting up an equation and then taking a t derivative. Hopefully we get down to two variables. Our last uh, police chase one, we got to three variables, but we knew about all, we knew about two of the three rates of change. So normally you only know one rate of change, you're supposed to find one more rate of change. So usually you want two variables. It's occasionally you, you use three variables. So let's lay out this picture right here. So Jet Airliner is flying at a constant altitude of 1,200 feet above sea level as it approaches the Pacific Island. Oh, it should be a period. Those didn't make it either. So the radar indicates the initial angle between sea level and the line of the site to the aircraft is 30 degrees. So let's do a nice quadrant one angle of 30 degrees. That's beautiful Pacific Island right there. It's very rectangular. The airplane is flying this direction. I only did this so I could get the 30 degrees in quadrant one. All right, constant altitude 12,000 feet above sea level. Is that an X or a Y measurement? So why? Is that Y changing? No. So that's constant. So it would be not the best idea to use Y here because this variable, this is not actually a variable, it's constant. So instead of writing Y, we don't need another variable. We're just going to say 1200. So that's not going to change right there. If you want to label in your, as your right triangle, you can label like this. That's 1200. So the question is not how far is the airplane from the island. The question is how fast is it approaching the island. So this we'll call x right here. It's a nice name for the horizontal coordinate. How do I relate side side with the angle? What trig function relates those three? So tangent. Tangent is the only one that doesn't use hypotenuse. Uh, well, actually, are they asking? So are they asking for the hypotenuse or for the x? We better be sure oh, and answer the right way. It's actually a little ambiguous. We'll make a choice. Is this how fast is the airplane approaching the island? Let's go with X. It's a little bit ambiguous, but let's go ahead and go with X right here. <coughs> so I'm going to choose to go with X here. If this is a quiz, you could ask me, hey, which one of these two do you really want? Which one do you mean by how fast is it approaching? So we'll pick the, uh, we're going to go for X. So any questions on why that was a choice right there? So we got tan opposite over x. Oh, I labeled 30 degrees. Is that angle changing? So I need another variable right there. What's a good variable for an angle? Oh, very nice. I already wrote it down already. All right, so we're going with theta right there. So I already used 1,200. 30 degrees is theta. I have that written down. However, they say the the radar or the angle is turning upward or in this case increasing at a rate of two thirds degrees per minute. How does that relate to the R variables here? Per second. Per second. 
That'd be a very slow moving aircraft. Alright, so what variable is this relating to? What variable is the only one measured in degrees? Theta. theta. Is that theta though? So it's sort of theta. But what is it actually describing about theta? The change in theta? Yep, so change in theta. Anything in related rates that's per unit of time, whether it's hours, minutes, seconds, or some other unit of time, it's going to be d, that variable dt. So this tells us how theta change over time. So we got a theta equation with theta and x in it. I want to know how fast is the aircraft approaching So in this case, it will be how does x change over time? <coughs> now, are we expecting a positive or negative dx over dt the way I drew this picture and the way the airplane's flying? <coughs> Looks like it should be negative. So I, it's at whatever larger value, and then it's going to be decreasing. Now, if I did negative 30 degrees, that'd be a little weird because you'd be flying underwater like a submarine in the way I drew it. Okay. I could have measured 30 degrees from the negative x-axis if I really wanted to. Right. So I could have done that. Okay. So we have a choice. Do you want to do a little algebra first or just go right with calculus? Go with calculus. We got a little quotient rule, though. I'd rather see a product rule than a quotient rule myself. So how do I get the x out of there? Multiply. So now we're ready to take a DDT. So we're avoiding the quotient rule. Of course, we still have a product rule. It's not like the derivative becomes trivial, but at least this way. I don't have to remember, is it u prime b? minus plus so this one's a little easier for me at least so derivative of x that is dx dt times original which is tan theta plus x what's the derivative of tangent theta secant squared is that all we need what else do we get So what's our last? So we need our theta prime or d theta dt. All right, derivative of every number, it's always zero. No matter what variable you take, derivative of any number is always zero. All right, we have most of these values. Let's plug in what we know. We said d theta dt is 2 thirds. We don't know x, but we do know theta. So we have secant squared is 1 over cosine squared, 30 degrees. Uh oh, what is x? How do I figure out x? Yep, so use our original before we take a derivative and figure out what x is as if nothing was changing. So you could think about this as if you took a picture with a really fast camera. You could see everything in, the same, in this exact position that I drew it. And at that exact moment, what was x? And so you just use that regular non-calculus. So you don't need calculus if the picture's not moving. So we're going to find x. So we have tan theta equals 1200 divided by x. What is tan 30? 
Is that 1 over square root 3? So let's reciprocate both sides. So we got square root 3 equals x over 12,000. So 12,000 square root 3 equals x. So that's our x value. Plus tangent theta, we just said was 1 over square root 3. dx dt. So cosine squared 30 degrees is so that's square root 3 over 2. Yeah. So it'll be square that. That's 3 fourths, which is 4 thirds when you reciprocate it. All right, fractions suck. Let's multiply, and square roots are even worse. So let's multiply everything by square root three. So we got dx dt plus. So that square root three times that square root three will cancel that square root three. And that square root three. So square root three times square root three divided by three cancels out to one. Uh, 1,200 divided by 3 is 4,000 times 8. And whatever number that is, 24,000. What's going on? This number is way too big. Why do you have an 8? 2 times 4. 3 times 4. 32. That's, that's really fast, though. So 4 times 4 is 8? And then 1,200, 12,000 divided by 3 is 4,000. Mm. Oh, yeah. So I think this is right, or it should be 30. Oh, so we're in feet per second. So our units are a weird uh, velocity measurement. All right, so get your science brains out. Let's go to miles per hour. That's usually how we think about airplane. Uh, 5,280. All right, let's make our science professors proud. <laughs> so we're in seconds, so we need lots of seconds in an hour. It's 36,000? 100? Seconds per hour. All right, so that'll cancel. That'll get us into hours. And then we need that loss of feet in a mile. 5,280. That still seems really fast. Oh, man. Don't they only go like 600 miles an hour? Maybe 800 if they're hustling? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> That's not even going to cut that number in half. <laughs> this is jet airliner. <laughs> it's got jets on it. Yeah, it's like spaceship speed. So we get two thirds of a degree per second. <sighs> I 
wonder if we should have converted that to radians. That might be messing us up. Yeah, it's too fast. All right, so let's turn 230 degree per second into radians per second. So what do I multiply by to get sum radians per second? So I need to divide by degrees and have rads in the numerator. Hi, 180, that should work, all right. So we get two pi over 270. Rads per second. All right, let's try that number instead. I just did the 180, reducing with the 2 is 90, times 3 is 270. Do you want a decimal that, or do you want I'll just go with this until, the, at the end, we'll get the decimal. Because obviously it's going to have a pi in it. So <laughs> you can treat it like 3, or 3 point whatever you need, 1, 4. So that doesn't change a whole lot until we get pretty much down to here. So let's clean up everything below. So we still get that cancellation. All right, so let's just type this into a calculator and get a number out. How about that? The I divided by 270. Times 4 times 12,000. 1,600 over 12,000 times 4 divided by 600 over 9 pi. No, it should be, <laughs> this should be about a third of what we see, about a third of 1,600. Because pi squared is close to 9. Times pi? That seems reasonable. Yeah, Alright, so now we got feet per second. And we turn this into miles per hour. We'll do that same trick we did before. Seconds per hour. All right, so that seems believable. Negative 380. Less exciting, but reasonable. <laughs> oh, it's not sad. So off the top of my head, I don't have a reason as to why we had to go to radians. 
Oh. Mess something up somewhere? Well, we've got both units. We've got theta and we've got degrees. Is it just flying over the island? Because it's not going down, it's staying at a constant. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly hasn't started the landing approach yet. It just wants to know if they could drop the bomb yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or begin circling. All right, so that's our last related rates. So to be more consistent, I'm going to try to use lines here. So this hopefully will keep me more consistent on sizing. If you look at the online notes, there's big fonts and small fonts, and you have to zoom in and out. So I'm going to try to reduce the amount of zooming in and out. And the random stuff, like four screens over. That may still happen. I may still go sideways, okay. literally. So he's going a little slow, or could have a headwind or something like that, too. More realistic than 22,000, I think. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> okay. So I am teaching pretty much everything in Chapter 4 together. And we are vaguely going to go 1 through 6, uh, 4.1 through 4.6 but I teach everything uh, sort of together at the same time. So I'll start out with the definition of critical points. I like this one the best. I'm going to try that thickness here. <laughs> you go too thick, it looks like graffiti. Oh, it's too thin. <laughs> Maybe this one. Critical point. All right, so critical point of F is any X comma y or f of x such that f prime of x equals zero. So it's all points that have a horizontal tangent. All right, horizontal tangents, there are three types. So we could have a, let's see, we'll do frowny face first. Smiley face second. So first one's local maximum. 
second one is local minimum. And the third type is going to be neither. So what does the third type look like? Looks sort of like a smirk. Halfway in between. So one side. Yep, absolutely. I look two ways. Uh, we call this inflection. Is that right? Min inflection, yeah. Now, of course, you can. There is a fourth type, which we won't really look at, but that's the sort of constant boring type right here. So they're pretty boring. Functions don't normally have those unless it's a artificially created step function. So forget about the constant. It's not really going to happen, but just nice to know that it's there. I think constant would technically be classified as inflection, but we're not dealing with too many constant functions. So I'm going to go in the order that I wrote them right here. So we'll do local max first. So let's say we had a local max at a comma f of a. So what that means is all x values close by have a lower y value. So that's what local max means for us right now. All the other y values close by are a little bit less, or maybe the same. How close by is close by? Depends on the function. Uh, if I write the full definition, there exists an open set, or I should say open interval. Let's go x minus delta comma x plus delta. I'm going to use the letter A, not x. Such that any x in this interval So the answer is, there just has to be one. So it could be really small, like from one-tenth to the left to one-tenth to the right, something like that. It could be one one-millionth. So as long as there's some positive delta, it'll work. So this is the really technical math definition that you don't really need to worry about right now. So even if it just like the function just in a, in a point that is like a tiny little dig, you can have one of these. And, but if you think about the inflection point, no matter what, if I look at the one on the right side, if I go any amount that direction, I'm going to have a larger y value. Right. So on the inflection point, any even tiny, tiny interval on the right side is going to have some y value that's bigger. In fact, probably every y value on the right side is going to be bigger if your interval is small enough. So that's why the inflection points, no matter how small you make your interval, you're going to have points on one side that are bigger, and the other side will be smaller. However, on our max and min, even if our function is kind of crazy, like maybe it goes like this, you could still say, I could zoom in far enough and say, there's some interval around each of these three maximums such that everything in that tiny little interval is less, has a lower y value. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we're going to come back and fill in some more definition in here, but for now this is what we're going to go with. Local min. So we'll go with B, F of B. So 
So the only thing that changes are inter-quality flips around. So the y values are all greater than the one that we have at the bottom. So I'm not going to rewrite the definition, the full definition. So we're say close y values are going to be bigger or equal. <coughs> and inflection point is going to be classified as neither of these two happening. So you can't say either of these two, we're going to go inflection point. So it's sort of the default. So, well, let's read this carefully. So if we have a max, it means all x close to, all points close to that local max have a less than or equal y value. All points have a the same or bigger. So would it be if means all x close to b have f of x? Yeah. Yeah. B. All right, so how can you have neither of these happening? It almost feels like we took care of everything. What happens if no matter how close you get, you have points that are greater and less than? And that's the exact idea of the inflection point. You've got points a little higher up, a little lower down, no matter how far you zoom in. a flat tangent line right. no matter what all three cases right. here's your tangent line so they're all horizontal tangents yes. but the question is is everything basically is everything below the tangent line that means you have a max is everything above the tangent line that means you have a min or is it mixed okay. is there some above some below does that make sense so inflection means so all nearby points have y values both bigger than f of c and smaller than f of c. So you don't have the biggest or the smallest. All around there is bigger and smaller. You don't have to go far. So now I'm going to talk about the second derivative, which is actually labeled as 4.2. So I'm going to just keep lecturing on the same page right here. I'm just going to write 4.2, second derivative. So concave up means f double prime of a is positive. So that means you're concave up at a comma f of a. So what does that mean? What is the der derivative of the derivative? How does that, what does that describe on the graph? So the derivative describes the slope. What does the derivative describe? You could say the slope of the slope, but that sounds a little silly. So what does it describe about the slope? 
Or another way to say that derivative describes how the function changes if you move to the right. So the second derivative describes how the function changes as it changes, or maybe how the function slope changes. How the slope changes? So let's think about how the slope changes. So what is this saying? The slope's changing. As I move to the right, the slope's getting bigger, more positive. So how does that look? So let's say our slope was already positive, and it's going to get more positive. What does that look like? That's an example of that, yeah. So it's positive, and it's getting more positive. Could look like this. So it's already greater than 0, and it's going to get even more positive as I go to the right. What happens if your slope started out negative, and then your slope is going to increase? Think about this function. Slope's negative the whole time, slope but the, uh, as I move to the right, the slope is getting less negative, or it's increasing. So flat now. So yeah, and, and actually could could start increasing as well. So it could look either of these two ways, and of course it could be a sort of a combination where it looks like a smiley face. Right. Yep, parabola is actually concave up the whole time. Always. Slope's always increasing. Starts out being a huge negative number, and then eventually goes to zero, and then starts increasing. Oh, I should go the other way. Starts out a huge negative number, goes to zero, and then increases. All right, so this is how concave up looks. It can look one of three ways, and I drew all three on the board. So this might be a little bit hard to remember. So I'm drawing here what's called normals. <coughs> if you were driving on motor in a motorcycle, they would point towards the inside of the turn that you were making. What's that? Spokes. You could think of it spokes, yeah. It's perpendicular to the tangent, is the way to think about it. And it's in the direction you're turning as opposed to the opposite or the direction you're not turning. Uh, it would be, it's called the normal force if you're in a car. This is what pulls the car through the turn. As you feel like you're leaning away because the car underneath of you is pulling. Like if you're making a left turn, the car is going left, and that's why you feel like you get thrown to the right if somebody does it quickly. But it's really the car's accelerating you to the left. All right, so these right here are called normals. And if you're concave up, your normals point uh, sort of inwards. And you're going to see concave down, they're going to point outwards. So if you're driving a motorcycle, you always want to think to the right no matter what. And concave up is going to be a left turn. So you're driving, to just always think to the right. And then concave up is a left turn. Does that make sense? Real quick. Yep. If a double derivative is perpendicular <coughs> to a derivative to the tangent line, would a triple derivative be parallel to the double derivative? Thus be... Uh, so well, the arrows I drew are not the double derivative. The double derivative describes the way the slope changes. So I'm just saying the slope is increasing. That's what concave up means. Maybe I should write that down. Now, the second example is really important. I drew that the slope is increasing, however, the function is not increasing. Function is decreasing. So slope increasing has nothing to do with the function increasing or decreasing itself. It talks about the rate of change of that happening. So left hand turn, yeah. All right, that's concave up. We're going to do concave down now.
So of course, that's the opposite. When f double prime of a is now less than zero or negative, and of course that's at a f of a, we can say the slope is decreasing. Concave down, yeah. When we say you'll get decreasing, you mean the slope will be decreasing. Right. Uh, it doesn't describe how the function is changing, it describes how the slope is changing. All right, slope is decreasing. There are three ways to draw it. If we, let's see, we started with an increasing function. So let's do an increasing function with a decreasing slope. How about that increasing function? Up to the right. However, the slope starts out being, I don't know, maybe four, ends up at the end being probably less than one. So it goes from a larger number to a smaller number. You could also have a decreasing function with a decreasing slope. So it starts out with some negative value and then gets more and more and more negative. Like that. So that's a decreasing function with a decreasing slope. And you could have both an increasing and decreasing function but your slope is starts out really positive, goes zero, and then goes negative. How small? It's yeah, just the so point? Like you've got your, let's say you have a, a frowny face parabola, okay? Um, and you've got, it's going to be uh, decreasing for the first half of it, and then you're going to hit your critical point, and then it's going to be increasing for the second half of it, right? Um, uh, wait, you said frowny face? Yeah. No. Be, well, okay, uh, so it's decreasing all the way around, sorry. Um, the slope is decreasing on a sad parabola. It starts out being a huge positive value, right. eventually gets up to zero, and then goes back down to some huge negative value. I, okay, I guess what I'm asking is how big is the curve? Typically? Like it's a point. It's, one. it's an x comma y. Okay. Everybody's, I mean, they could be arbitrarily large or small x or y values, okay. but there's, it's just a point. It's never been Uh, if you do have an interval of critical points, your function is is a horizontal a in that in that interval. Okay. So if your slope is flat over an interval, you have a horiz you have a uh, constant function. Uh, that being said, you can have some weird function like this that has lots of local mins and maxes, like all in a row. So they could be spaced very closely. Okay. Is that more answer to your question? So there might be five packed into a small interval. But each one itself is still just a point. All right, so we can draw our arrows in. Let's see. I think if you draw your arrows, the book draws them towards the center of the curve you're making. So if you draw your arrows towards the center of the curve, they're going to point downwards. Do your normal ball point towards the focus? Uh, one of them will. Okay. Maybe more of them will. Uh, the problem with that is in a circle they will, but not in an ellipse. All right. They'll point vaguely towards the foci, but not at the foci. And that's only something in an ellipse, and maybe a parabola has that as well. Or something like the, uh, maybe something like a foci. All right, so here is concave down what it looks like. Now what we're going to do is use concave up, concave down with local max, local min. All right, local max, we know what it looks like. Right there on the left, local max, concave up or down? Down. Down. Frowny face, or sad face. <coughs> so 
both right. Concave frown. <laughs> concave down. All right, so we got a frowny face. So that means f prime a equals zero and f double prime a less than zero. And that's what you need to remember. Horizontal tangent, but you're concave down. So I'm going to underline that. That's important to remember. So what you do is you set your derivative equal to zero in order to find your critical point. And then you take your double derivative and that will tell you if it's positive or negative whether that your critical point is a maximum or a minimum. Correct. Except for in the case of the cube. Which then your so the procedure, that's exactly right. The procedure, we're going to set our derivative equal to zero. We're going to get all the critical points, all the critical values, and then we're going to classify them with the second derivative by seeing them as positive, negative, or zero, which is neither. So if you were to put the double derivative, if you found the double derivative, you put it in the same decimals or something like that, where it pointed, where it hit the zero, or crossed over the uh, x-axis, it would be, that would be your uh, critical points. Uh, well, hold on. So inflection points are either concave up or concave down. So what you get is f prime c equals zero and f double prime c equals zero. So concave up and down generally happens over an interval. Uh, and yeah, some points will be concave up, some will be concave down. And where basically where it switches from concave up to down is called an inflection point. So generally, inflection points won't be intervals. The only time they will be is if your function is actually, if your slope's not changing, uh, which means your slope is constant. So you could have a basically any line, no matter what the slope is, is going to be neither concave up or down. It doesn't have to be a flat line, however, for the for it to have no concavity, like. Yeah, this diagonal line has no concavity, but it's also the slope's not zero, it's just not changing. 